The Soviet Union was one of the few countries that invested heavily in the development of armored cars before the Second World War. The experience of the Russian Civil War, where armored cars demonstrated their effectiveness in providing mobility and firepower, influenced the Red Army's interest in this type of military equipment. Many of these wheeled vehicles were more modern and could, in terms of armor and armament, compare equally with many pre-war tank designs. However, there were earlier Soviet armored car designs that were already outdated and obsolete on the day that they entered service. This was the case with the Nikolai Ivanovich Derenkov's Do Osam and Do Venest, which saw service with the Red Army in limited numbers. When the First World War broke out in Europe, the Russian Empire joined its Western allies against the Central Powers. Three years later, due to incompetent leadership of the army, economic stagnation, and civil discontent, the once great empire embarked on the path of civil war. What was left of its territories was engulfed in a civil war between the Communist Red Army, the Royalist White Army, and many more minor factions. The vast and often challenging terrain of Russia made mobility crucial for both the Red and White Armies. Railways and armored trains saw extensive action, and similarly, armored cars were also put to good use. Armored cars allowed armies to quickly respond to changing front lines and engage in hit-and-run tactics. The ability to traverse various types of terrain was a significant advantage, although road and terrain conditions still severely limited their mobility. The concept of armored cars was not new to the Russians. In the early 1900s, the Imperial Russian Army showed interest in their potential use. However, given the underdeveloped local industry, their evolution was limited. Nevertheless, during the First World War, Russia employed some 300 armored cars of various designs and origins. While the use of quite a number of completely different designs caused huge logistical issues, their performance was deemed acceptable. Following the Red Army's victory, the lessons of this civil war were not forgotten. The armored car pool was greatly depleted, and the remaining vehicles were in disrepair. Due to their age and different origins, the acquisition of spare parts was almost impossible. Domestic production was seen as a solution to this issue, but in the 1920s, this was not possible on a large scale due to the underdeveloped Soviet industry, which was incapable of producing such vehicles. After Stalin came to power, he initiated a series of reforms with the aim of introducing the rapid industrialization of the Soviet Union. While the results of these reforms are questionable, they achieved their aim of starting the limited production of military armored vehicles, such as tanks and armored cars. The first post-war design developed by the Soviets was the Bava 27 in the late 1920s. Given the general heavyweight, the overall drive performance of the BA-27 was rather poor. A new vehicle that was cheap, easy to build, and with improved performance was badly needed. Due to the devastated economic infrastructure, the development of new armored vehicles was not an easy task. Luckily for the Soviets, they managed to sign an agreement with the American Ford Company for the licensed production of the Ford Model A and AA cars and trucks. Ford's support was vital in opening new production facilities, such as the Gorky Automobile Plant and the Kommunistische Amladinske Internationale in the early 1930s. As American trucks were rolling out of Soviet factories, Derenkov, an armored car enthusiast, saw the Ford A 4x2 chassis as an adequate base for a new armored car. Derenkov wanted to design his vehicle completely differently from the existing BA-27, and started by removing any unnecessary weight, such as the turret. This vehicle was to receive only a light armament sufficient for self-defense. Derenkov intended for this vehicle to be used only for reconnaissance, and direct combat would be avoided whenever possible. After some time spent drafting the first drawings and calculations, he received a green light for the implementation of the project. The new vehicle was designated simply as D-8, where the D stood for Derenkov, and was finally ready in 1931, when it was presented to the Soviet army to be tested. During these trials, several problems were noted. The D-8 had a poor off-road drive, and crew visibility was limited. Having no turret meant that the crew had to use four firing ports, which proved difficult to operate properly due to the cramped interior. Despite all these drawbacks, a production order was given. 
The D-8 hull consisted of a front-mounted engine and a central crew compartment, built on the chassis of the Ford A. In order to cope with the extra weight, the axles and suspension had to be reinforced. Each of the axles was suspended using semi-elliptic springs, and mechanical brakes were provided on all four wheels. The armoured car was powered by a four-cylinder Ford A engine delivering 40 HP at 2,200 RPM. With it, the D8 was capable of achieving maximum road speeds of up to 85 km an hour, or 53 miles per hour. As it did not have all-wheel drive, its off-road performance was limited to only 30 km an hour, or 19 miles per hour. The D8's armoured structure was made using angled armour plates which were welded together. One noticeable feature of this design was the highly angled rear part of the vehicle. On the front part of the engine compartment was a protective lubed grille, and on the sides, two two-part hatches were installed. The enclosed crew compartment was provided with two doors, one located on each side of the vehicle. From the start, engineer Dedenkov decided to ditch the idea of using a gun-armed turret. The purpose of the vehicle was not engaging in offensive action, but rather gathering intelligence on the enemy. If the D8 had to be used in combat for the vehicle and crew's defense, a 7.62mm Dota Mitralis was used. Given the lack of a turret, in order to have the best possible firing arc, Derenkov decided to use four firing ports, one placed on each side. In theory, this solved the issue of lacking a turret. In reality, during testing, the use of the side machine gun ports proved difficult and was quickly abandoned. When the prototype was presented to the Soviet army, Marshal Klement Voroshilov insisted a second machine gun be placed facing the rear of the vehicle. The use of two machine guns inside the cramped interior caused more problems than it was worth. The commander had trouble operating the two, as he had to change his position often, which was not easy to do. The ammunition load consisted of 4,158 rounds of ammunition with around a third of this ammunition consisting of armor-piercing rounds. Given its lightweight and small size, the D8 was only lightly protected. The front and side armor plates were 7mm thick, the top and rear armor were 6mm, and the bottom was only 3mm, 0.11 inches thick. The D8 was only fully protected against regular small-caliber rounds and fragments. The crew consisted of only two men, the commander, who was also the machine gun operator, and the driver. The driver's position was on the left, and the commander was on the other side. The commander was quite overburdened with the different tasks that he had to perform. Besides his commanding role, he also had to act as a spotter and take care of the machine gun, firing, changing positions, and loading. This greatly limited his effectiveness in combat situations. Despite its basic design being meant for reconnaissance operation, the D-8 was not provided with radio equipment. As the D-8 entered production, some in the Soviet army came up with the idea of transporting these armoured vehicles by air. For this purpose, a TB-3 heavy bomber was modified by adding a specially designed connecting frame that could hold two D-8s. This contraption was tested during a military airborne training exercise held in Ukraine in 1934. It proved to be successful, and in 1936, the Soviets changed the organizational structure of airborne brigades to include 98 armored cars. By 1937, only one brigade actually received 68 armored cars. Eventually, after only one year, the whole D-8 airborne concept was cancelled. Besides this role, the D-8 was used for testing a few other ideas. In 1932, a few D-8s were equipped with fully protected turrets. The installation proved to be promising, and its further development led to the introduction of the FIA-E armored car. Another proposal included adapting the D-8 to be able to drive on rail tracks. The modification involved adding four new steel wheel frames. These were actually placed around the original wheels. While one vehicle was tested, the project was abandoned. Despite his initial design plans, Derenkov quickly became aware that he would have to find a way to improve the firing arc of the D-8. A turret could easily solve this problem, but Derenkov wanted another solution without adding additional weight. In the end, he made up his mind to use a fully rotating machine gun mount as a replacement for an enclosed turret. This left its operator completely exposed to enemy return fire. 
making the use of this machine gun very dangerous. The general idea was to improve the flexibility of the armament and to act as an auxiliary anti-aircraft vehicle. The new armament consisted of one hole positioned DT machine gun and one 7.62mm .3 inches, 1910 Maxim water-cooled machine gun placed on this new mount, although some vehicles were armed with two DT machine guns instead. The ammunition load for the Maxim was 2,090 rounds and 2,080 rounds of ammunition for the DT. Other changes also included simplifying the rear superstructure armor plates design. This redesigned vehicle received the D-12 designation. Given the number of issues identified with the D-8 and 12, only a small production order was ever issued. It is believed that around 60 vehicles of both versions were ever built. The D-8 and D-12 service life was quite brief. They were mostly used on military parades, but also saw some limited combat action. After 1932, these two models were mostly replaced with the FAI armored car. By 1938, most, if not all, were allocated for training purposes. Some sources claim that the D-8 and D-12 saw combat in the Spanish Civil War and during the Soviet invasion of Poland. But evidence for this is lacking. They did see service during the Winter War of 1940 between the Soviet Union and Finland. At least three D-8s from the 9th Army were lost around Karelia. The Finnish forces even managed to capture at least one D-8. By the time of the Axis invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941, there were some 45 such vehicles distributed to various military districts. Nearly all were out of service awaiting repairs. It is unknown if they were used against the Germans, but this seems unlikely given their poor state of repair and low numbers. A few D-8s and D-12s were given to Mongolia, a Soviet ally. The last such vehicle was seen during a victory parade held in Mongolia in September 1945. This concludes our exploration of the D-8 and D-12 early Soviet armored car designs. What do you think of these designs? Is the cheaper option always better? Let us know in the comments section. As always, we appreciate your support, so please like and subscribe to get automatic updates when new content rolls out. If you'd like to buy us some fuel to keep us rolling, please consider visiting us on Patreon and experience the benefits of becoming a patron or by contributing to us directly via PayPal. Until next time, stay tuned and keep following our updates.